Um, and things are not as bad with the trucks for the big three. Uh, again, Chrysler doing better than Ford and GM, uh, but they've really got their act together much better on trucks than they do on cars, and that's really not a surprise. Uh, and then when you take it uh, in total, again, those weak car sales really hurting Ford and a whole lot less pain and suffering overall. And I can tell I'm going to have to oops, excuse me, speed up a little bit here if I'm going to make it in time. <laughs> So what are we selling? Uh, we have pickup trucks, uh, still with a very large portion of the market share. Uh, and we have our old standbys. Middle cars are still what America drives for the most part. These are your Toyota Camrys, your Honda Accords, your Ford Fusion now. Uh, small cars still out there doing quite well. The real big story there is the crossover vehicles, uh, which basically imitates uh, SUVs uh, but we're now building them on a car-based platform, and we're making them much more fuel efficient and kind of a more portable package. And if we look at change, which segments are now popular and where are the decreases taking place? First of all, I would ask you to almost dismiss that van figure. It's a bit of a fluky number. Um, <laughs> the market leader, Chrysler, in a changeover year. Um, plus, the van segment has not been that great, so when you put those two things together, um, they're, they're not very, very positive there. Uh, the really big story of what is happening is people are leaving SUVs for CUVs. And when you think about it, it's a comparable vehicle, um, it's a comparable, comparable vehicle um, that is lighter, handles easier, and gets much better fuel economy. And so you might have expected, for example, with the fuel prices that we're seeing, everyone to be jumping into small cars because that's where we, where we have the greatest fuel efficiency. However, small cars are a poor substitute for, a, for an SUV. And really, American buyers are not, you know, despite the improved fuel economy, if they know they're going to leave this segment, uh, that fuel economy isn't enough to make them jump into the most fuel efficient segment they're going to take the next best thing, improved fuel economy, but still a lot of the functionality that they enjoy. And that's why it's such a huge success in that crossover, as we call it, uh, segment. Uh, what do we expect in the future? Well, we expect uh, mid-sized cars, that red line, to continue to be very popular. Uh, but if you add up the two categories, and they're really kind of blurred and blended anyway, multi-activity vehicles and crossovers, um, largely one and the same. Uh, that is really what is going to be by the time all of this shakes out. Uh, that's what Americans will be driving the most. Uh, more than just the, um, the sedans that we have been used to. And it is in fact a model that is similar uh, to what is taking place in Europe and what is taking place in Asia. Um, a few bleak slides now, and these are bleak. Uh, what we're monitoring here is uh, we've changed gears entirely into employment. Uh, this is automotive employment for both motor vehicle, so we're talking vehicle assembly, uh, and also parts manufacturing. Uh, a few different numbers that we're tracking, that blue line up above, which is judged on that right-hand axis, that's U.S. employment over the years from 1999 through 2007. And as you can tell, off by quite a bit. Uh, down below, we have Ohio and Indiana. The most striking line there is Michigan, with by far the most negative slope. And that's really sort of the story of what we're seeing. Um, the Midwest is the part of the country that is hurt the most by the restructuring of the big three. Uh, by the layoffs and the plant closings and so forth. Um, but in the Midwest, Ohio and Indiana have been more successful in attracting investment from the international automakers, uh, specifically Toyota in Indiana and quite a large Honda presence in Ohio. And in their case, those uh, gains are almost, almost enough to offset the losses in big three employment. Michigan, on the other hand, has been able to get some parts facilities uh, from the international uh, automotive suppliers, uh, but not one automaker facility uh, by an in international firm, whether Korean or European or Japanese, 
that actually builds cars. And so Michigan really has the two sort of worst sides of the coin. Uh, one, the losses from the big three uh, with no replacement from the international automakers. Uh, and that is why proportionally so much more of the hurt from this restructuring is centered right there in Michigan. And I think that really kind of portrays it well. Um, this is in the background what is really happening. Um, you know, this is a chart that we at CAR have tracked for years. And in the past, you know, a few years ago, these two lines showing the international automakers and their market share and showing the uh, big three and their market share, they did not cross. Okay, a few years ago, we had this chart uh, with the big three maintaining a slight sales edge. And then a few years ago, the lines started crossing. We started predicting that eventually the big three would sell fewer vehicles than the internationals. And in the last few years, the point where they started crossing got to actually be now in the past. It has already happened. And uh, here's another employment look. I think it's appropriate in, slight in, in light of the uh, restructuring, restructurings that we have had take place. Um, and again, big three and international automotive employment. And when you really look at things, um, that big three line in blue and the rapid decreases there, um, when you take it all together, that, that's the real decline that we're talking about in big three jobs. And as you can tell, the increases from the internationals, which are that bottom line, are not nearly enough to recoup the losses that we have had from the big three. And so we have an industry that when you just take it all together and add it all up, employs fewer people than it has in the past. Um, and at this point, in fact, um, Troy, if I could ask for guidance on timing. This is a breaking point. I can stop here or I can keep going. Uh, as I say, maybe another like five minutes if you want to get through a few more slides. Okay. okay. Five minutes. We'll do it. Um, this is a chart that uh, I think is appropriately entitled the Table of Pain. Uh, it's intended to provide a look at the world uh, from the point of view of an automotive supplier. Now, um, there's a, just a little bit of um, alphabet soup taking place here, so I won't get into each number, but basically we know the automotive industry supplies to the consumer a product uh, that has become more sophisticated over time, uh, includes much more content, it includes uh, more airbags, uh, emissions equipment, safety, you name it, in addition to computers and everything else. Um, and so what we're comparing here in light of that um, is changes in various prices from 1998 through 2006. So all things taken together uh, from that period, the consumer, in terms of the CPI, the consumer is paying relatively less for a car than they did in the past, but the car itself has become better and more complex and includes more content. So from an industry point of view, we have to provide more but receive less money in exchange. Now, if we just look, and I won't get into every one because of time, but all of these inputs, whether you're talking steels, petroleums, healthcare, everything that we put into that vehicle has become more expensive. So when you add it all up, we're providing more, we're getting less in exchange, and everything that we use to provide more has become more expensive. So no surprise then for the intense competition in this industry, and no surprise also that we have as, as many automotive suppliers going bankrupt as we've seen. And imports, I think uh, I'll skip ahead a few slides and show you this. Um, if we were to look, if we sort of took the entire supplier sector uh, in the United States over the 